I'm supposed to find the area of the right triangle, ABC. Always assume that C is the right angle. A and B are either acute angle. If A is 5 feet, B is 18 feet. One of the many formulas to find the area of a triangle is area equals one half the base times the height, where the base and the height are, well in this case, the two legs of the right triangle. In some triangles, the base could just mean any side, and the height could mean an altitude that intersects that side. So multiplying a half times five times eighteen, half of five is two point five, so I'd rather just take half of eighteen. When you're multiplying two or more numbers together, you can multiply in any order. So I'm going to multiply the half times eighteen. Then nine times five is forty-five. So the area of this triangle is forty-five square feet. Question number two, we're supposed to solve this right triangle. That means find all the missing parts where A is 4, B is 60 degrees. You're supposed to give exact answers. Now, depending on what you're given for this problem, this problem can be done in lots of different ways. Once again, assume that angle C is the right angle. A and B are interchangeable. Opposite capital A is lowercase a. Opposite capital B is lowercase b. Opposite capital C is lowercase c. This particular problem is pretty simple because it's a special right triangle. If you have a 16 and 90 degree angle, it means the third one has to be a 30, so it's a special right triangle, and we know that side A is 4. Special right triangle 30, 60, 90. Opposite 30, we've said, is beta. Opposite 90 is 2 beta. Opposite 60 is beta, square roots of 3. Once you redraw a triangle like we did here, so that it's orientated in the same way as the triangle you're given, in other words, the angles are in the same positions, take the side you know the length of, which is 4, set it equal to the side it corresponds to in the equivalent triangle. So beta is 4. Well, if that's 4, that means opposite 90 is 2 times 4, which is 8. It means opposite 60 would be 4 times the square root of 3, which of course is 4 square roots of 3. So that 8 corresponds to C, and beta square roots of 3 corresponds to B. So to sum up, B is 4 square roots of 3, C is 8, and angle A is 30 degrees. Just to solve the right triangle, find all the missing parts, we have done that. Question 3, write a formula for the law of sines in terms of the sides and angles of a triangle. So let's first draw that triangle, labeling the angles with capital letters, labeling the sides opposite those letters with the same letter but lowercase. According to the law of sines, if your triangle looks like that, if you take sine of an angle over its opposite side, it'll be equal to sine of another angle over its opposite side, which in turn will be equal to sine of a third angle over its opposite side. Question 4. Write a formula for the law of cosines in terms of the sides and angles of triangle ABC, A, B, C. So draw a triangle, label the angles A, B, and C, capital printed letters, Label the sides opposite those angles as same letters, but lowercase. Law of cosines says write a formula. So we don't have to write all three. They're all three equivalent. Pick any side you want and square it. Set that equal to the other two sides squared and added together. Subtract from that two times the two sides that are on the same side of the equation of what we're just writing. In other words, C was on the left side, so we just squared a and b, so we're subtracting 2 times a, b. Multiply that by cosine of the angle opposite the first letter you started with. You started with side c, so it ends up with angle c. Other versions of this is that you could have had b squared equals c squared plus a squared minus 2ca times cosine of 
angle A, I think that's what I started with, or you could have B squared equals A squared plus C squared equal uh, minus 2AC times cosine of angle B. Any one of those three. Question five, what given information for a triangle constitutes the ambiguous case of sine law, or the ambiguous case of sines? Well, it's any time that you're given angle, side, side, which means you're given two sides and non-included angle. If you're given that situation, then you could have two solutions, one solution or no solution. So that's the ambiguous case when you give an angle side side. Question six, graphically show how to add these two vectors with the parallelogram method. Well, you take the two vectors you're given and you redraw them tail to tail. So I translated A down here, translated B down here as well. Then you draw an identical vector A that starts from the head of B and goes in the same direction that the original A was going in. Remember, two vectors are identical if they have the same magnitude and they have the same direction. So it doesn't matter where A is drawn on here. Those two A vectors are identical. And if I draw vector B parallel to its original in the same length, I get vector B like so. The resultant starts at the original two tails, which was starting here, and it's a diagonal of this parallelogram, like so. That red ray is a vector. It's the resultant vector. Question 7. Graphically show how to add these three vectors with the head-to-tail method. I must cut off some of my words there, but it's the head-to-tail method. This is simple. Draw one of your vectors with the same direction and the same magnitude. After you draw that, take your next vector, whichever one you want to be your next one. Starting with its tail, we go onto the head of this one. It's like a human centipede, quite frankly. Like so. And then take your last vector, which in this case is vector C and relocate it so it has the same magnitude and same direction as the original C. The resultant then goes from the original tail that you first drew to the last head that you just drew. This blue vector is the resultant vector of A, B, and C. Question 8. Two ropes are pulling horizontally on a boat. Rope A pulls with 120 pounds of force, while rope B pulls with 50 pounds of force. The angle between the two ropes is 120 degrees. What one force would equivalently, equivalently replace these two forces? What angle does this equivalent force make to rope B? Both of those questions are asking for the resultant. It's asking for the magnitude, which would be in pounds, and it's asking for the angle, which is going to be in degrees. So the first sentence, two ropes are pulling on a boat. So imagine that we're looking at a boat, and this is supposed to be a top-down view, but I don't know how to draw a top-down view of a boat. One person is pulling on this boat with rope B. Another one is pulling with rope A. Let's say this is rope A, and let's say this is rope B. Those ropes are vectors. Rope A pulls with 120 pounds of force. B pulls with 50 pounds of force. The angle between them is 120 degrees, like so. So we are supposed to figure out the resultant, the resultant magnitude and the resultant direction. There's lots of ways to do this. You could use the component method, which takes a lot of time. You could use the parallelogram method, which takes a lot less time. I'm going to choose to do the parallelogram method, although please understand that you could also use the component method. The parallelogram method means that I 
repeat each of these vectors, so I have a parallelogram, I find then a, another angle in this parallelogram, an adjacent, not an adjacent, a consecutive angle. Two consecutive angles in a parallelogram are always supplementary. So 120 plus 60 is 180. Supplementary means when you add them, you get 180. If I relabel this vector over here as B, 50 pounds, my resultant would be this green vector that starts at my original tails and goes diagonal of that parallelogram. So when it's all said and done, to make this picture simpler, I have vector A, which is 120 pounds. I have vector B, which is pulling with 50 pounds. The angle between them is 60 degrees in this picture. The resultant, this green vector, would be like so. The question asks, what angle does this force make with rope B? And I should have read that more clearly the first time. I don't want to draw that picture. Let me uh, start over here with this last part. Let's redraw this picture again. It says, what angle does it make with force? What angle does this force make with rope B? Because it says that, it's going to be less work if I draw vector B first. You don't have to, but it's going to make it less work in the long run. And then from that head, draw vector A. It's still going to be 60 degrees between them, and the resultant vector is this green vector. Once again, the reason why I chose that, it says, what angle does this make with rope B? So we'll call that theta. This is the resultant. It's going to make this uh, easier if we do it like this. So how do we do this? We can use the law of cosines for this. Let's say that we have, let's say this is angle C, this is angle A, and this is angle B. So if I take C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB times cosine of angle C, and I replace what I know, and replace with what I don't know. For example, C is the resultant vector, so we'll call that R. A is 120 pounds. I don't need to put the label in. Vector B has a magnitude of 50. And I subtract 2 times 120 times 50 times cosine, I'm running out of room here, of angle C, which is 60 degrees. That 60 should be right beside the cosine, I ran out of space. Let me uh, organize my work a little bit better here. So if I continue, I'm going to get r squared equals 120 squared is 14,400. 14, 50, I left my squared off there, let me highlight that. 50 squared is 2,500. 2 times 120 times 50 is 12,000. And then bring down my cosine of 60 degrees. Combine like terms, 14,400 and 2,500. We can add those together to get 16,900. Bring down the 12,000 times cosine of 60 degrees. Then I want to get r by itself, so I square root both sides. When you take an even root, technically it's plus or minus. This is a resultant vector, which is always positive. If you throw this in your calculator, you're going to get the resultant's magnitude is approximately 127.7. This is being measured in pounds. So the first question was, what one force would equivalently replace these two forces? Well, that's a force of 127.7 pounds. Then the last question asked, 
what angle does this equivalent force make with rope B? Well, R is the equivalent force, the resultant. We can see here that we have vector B, so it's that angle theta. To find that, we can use the law of sines. We could say sine of 60 degrees over its opposite side of R, which is 127.7 approximately, is equal to, so I got that because using the law of sines here, we just figured out R was 127.7, is equal to sine of theta over its opposite side of 120. Trying to get theta by itself, I can multiply both sides by 120. So we get 120 times sine of 60 degrees over 127.2. Having writing problems right now. I apologize. Then to get theta by itself completely, we could use sine inverse on both sides of the equation. On the left, you get sine inverse of 120 times sine of 60 degrees over 127.2 equals theta. Throw that in your calculator, making sure that you're using degree mode. You should get approximately 28 degrees is what theta is. So to answer this question, this two-part question, we're going to do so in one sentence. So listen carefully to the sentence. The resultant would have a magnitude of 127.7 pounds with a 28 degree counterclockwise from rope B. Let me just make sure you understand why it's counterclockwise. We had rope B here, we had the resultant here. So from B you are rotating the opposite way of a clock. That's why it's counterclockwise. So once again, sentence. Magnitude is 127.7 pounds with a 28 degree counterclockwise angle from rope B. Question 9. Vector A consists of two components. A sub x is 2 and A sub y is negative 11. Vector B consists of two components. B sub x is 6 and B sub y is 3. Find the magnitude of the resultant of vectors A and B using the component method. Component method is pretty simple if you know what the components are, and we do. The x component of the resultant vector can be found by summing the x component of vector A and the x component of vector B. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to figure out the y component of vector R, the resultant, by summing the y component of vector A and the y component of vector B. It says up here that the x component for A is 2, and that the x component of B is 6. 2 plus 6 is 8. The resultant has an x component of 8. So we go horizontally to the right because it's positive 8. Uh, we don't have any units, so it's just 8 somethings. This is R sub x. To figure out the y component of the resultant, we sum the y components of a and b. a is negative 11, b is 3. If you sum those, you get negative 8. So once we, start, once we stopped with the x component of the resultant, so the head, if you will, then we're supposed to go down 8. r sub y is 8. That negative tells you which direction. So it says go down. You don't have to put the negative into this picture when you do that. It's also probably a good idea to put the components on the outside of this triangle, not on the inside. The result then would be this black vector. We are fortunate in this problem. This is a special right triangle. 
I know that because the two legs are the same length, the 8 and the 8, and it's a right triangle. If the two legs are the same length, that means this is a 45, 45, 90. The isosceles triangle theorem from geometry says that if you have two legs of a triangle, if you have two sides of a triangle that are the same length, then the angles opposite those are the same. So they would have to be 45 and 45 in this case. So finishing this, it's pretty simple. Once again, this is a special right triangle. If the two legs are 8, what is opposite of 90 has to be that times the square root of 2. So this resultant is going to be 8 times the square root of 2. This question asked for the magnitude. It didn't ask for the direction, just asked for the magnitude. So we could say the magnitude is 8 square root of 2. If you want to throw that in your calculator to give an approximate answer as well, you can. Exact answers typically are best. Question 10, solve triangle ABC when you have A is 15 degrees, B is 40, and A is 20. You have to be careful when you do these problems that after you draw your triangle and label the parts you know the lengths of or measures of, that you're not given angle side side. If you're given angle side side, you have to be careful because there could be no solution, one solution, or two solutions. If you're not given angle side side, you don't have to be so careful putting this information into my picture. Remember the opposite an angle is the same letter but lowercase. We are given two angles and a side, so it's not angle side side. You have to then you have to then make a conclusion or deduction, a deduction, which isn't a word. Are you going to use law of sines or law of cosines to do this? If you have a known pair, an angle and the side opposite of it, you're going to use law of sines. If you don't, then you won't. Also, probably should do before I even do that, if you know two angles in a triangle, you can always find the third with the angle sum theorem, which says that when you add up all the angles in a triangle, you get 180 degrees. 15 and 40 is 55. If I subtract 55 from both sides of the equation. I'm going to get that angle C. I'll tell you what, I don't like how I wrote my C's. They look small. Lowercase are sides, uppercase are angles. So C is going to be 125 degrees. It's not rounded, which is great, which means I don't have to feel bad about using that to find missing things in this picture. So using the law of sines once again. I could take sine of 15 degrees over its opposite side of 20, and I could set it equal to sine of 40 degrees over its opposite side of B, and then I can solve that. I can also make another equation from this. I could say sine of 15 degrees over 20 equals sine of 125 over its opposite side of C. These are the two equations that we're going to have to finish in order to figure out what these missing sides are. In each case, if we multiply both sides by our denominators, so in this orange equation, if we multiply both sides by 20 and B, we're going to get B times sine of 15 degrees equals 20 times sine of 40 degrees. To get B by itself, I would divide both sides by sine of 15 degrees and get B is 20 times sine of 40 divided by sine of 15. Throw that into your calculator. You're going to get B is approximately 49.7. If I solve this black equation they have over here, if I multiply both sides by 20 and C, I'm going to get C times sine of 15 degrees equals 20 times sine of 125. I didn't give myself enough space over here. Tell you what, let me continue this down here. Hopefully you have plenty of room on your paper that you don't have to do something crazy like this. 
So once again, I had C times sine of 15, I'm writing too big, equals 20 times sine of 125. That's what that was supposed to say. To get C by itself, divide both sides by sine of 15. And once again, when you're writing this on your paper, organization is everything. So hopefully you don't have this arrow drawn. Hopefully you're writing this right underneath over there. If you throw this into your calculator, you get that side C is about 63.3. We're not given any units, so we don't know what kind of units this is. When you get finished, see if your answers are reasonable. I have opposite my smallest angle, 15, is my smallest side, 20. Opposite the next biggest angle, 40, is side B, which is 49.7. Opposite my largest angle, which is 125 degrees, is my largest side. So it seems reasonable this could be the answer to this. Number 11, solve this triangle, ABC. Let's draw it. doesn't matter which is A, B, or C, just as long as the opposite side is the same letter but lowercase. So we know here that angle A is 50 degrees, and we know that side B is 10, and that side A is 22. Once again, the first thing you should look for, is this the ambiguous case of sines? Am I given angle, side, side? And we are in this case. We have angle A, and then a side, and then a side. That's angle, side, side. Which means this problem is potentially a lot more work than most problems. So let's figure out if it's more work. First, use law of sines to figure out how many solutions there are. We're going to take sine of 50 over its opposite side of 22 and set it equal to sine of b over its opposite side of 10. If the answer that I get to this equation is 90 degrees, then there is 100% certainty that there is one solution. If the answer that I get from this is some kind of an error in my calculator, it's extremely likely that there is no solution. If the answer that I get from this is an acute answer, an angle between 0 and 90, it's extremely likely that there's two answers. Continuing to solve this, multiply both sides by 10. You get 10 times sine of 50 degrees over 22 equals sine of b. If you apply sine inverse to both sides of the equation, we get 10 times sine of 50 degrees over 22 equals b. Throw that in your calculator, you get a about, it's about 21 degrees, pardon me, it's about 20 degrees. Since this answer is acute, it means there's likely two solutions. Likely. I'm going to put a little question mark there because it's possible that there's not. To find the alternate solution to angle B, Angle B and its alternate, its bizarro B, which would be B prime, those summed to 180 degrees. So 20 degrees plus B prime equals 180 degrees, so B prime is 160 degrees. So if the second triangle exists, the B prime is 160 degrees. So let's continue with our two solutions. Here's what we do next. On our paper, we're going to divide it into two parts. One part, we're going to use that B is 20 degrees. And the other part, we're going to use that B prime, it's the alternate version of B, is 160 degrees. We'll call one of these solution 1, and the other one solution 2. So redraw this triangle. same way I drew it before, this time adding in the pieces that I know, the extra piece that I know, which is angle B, 20 degrees. Now 
If you sum up all the angles in a triangle, you get 180. So angle C plus 20 degrees plus 50 degrees equals 180 degrees. My handwriting suddenly got taking a turn for the worst. 20 and 50 is 70. If you subtract 70 from both sides, you're going to get C is 110 degrees. Yes, that's rounded because the original B was rounded. But that's the best we can do for that. We have everything now but side C. So to um, make our answer as accurate as we can, let's use the original ratio that we had which was sine of 50 degrees over 22 equal to we're trying to figure out what side C is. So it's sine of 110 over C. If you multiply both sides by 22 and C On the left, you're going to get C times sine of 50 degrees. On the right, you're going to get 22 times sine of 110 degrees. If you divide both sides by sine of 50, you get C is 22 times sine of 110 over sine of 50. If you put that in your calculator, you get approximately 27.0. So one of our solutions then is B is 20 degrees, angle C is 110 degrees, and side C is 27.0. For our alternate solution, we redraw this triangle, and the parts that we didn't know originally we call primes. So we don't know angles A or B or C, we don't know side C. The alternate versions are called primes. The original ones are not. So we got that angle B prime was 160 degrees. And we find out pretty shortly that there's not two solutions. Because when we use the angle sum theorem to figure out what angle C is, we get a pretty ridiculous answer. We get that C prime is negative 30 degrees. In a triangle, your angles are always, pardon me, negative 30 degrees. In a triangle, your angles are always positive. So from this, we can conclude there's only one solution. We thought there might be two because we got an original acute answer, but one of our answers is insane. So this problem has one solution. Question 12, what is the eastward component, that's the x component, of a vector with magnitude of 110 miles per hour and bearing north 70 degrees east? Northeast is like so. If it's north 70 degrees east, we could have one vector, the one component being drawn like this, that would be north. 70 degrees towards the east would be here. Then we have the horizontal component of this. We'll call this vector x component, vector y component, and vector of 100 miles per hour. What is the eastward component? It's asking for v sub x. We could use sine right angle trig of 70 degrees equals the opposite leg of v sub x over the hypotenuse, which is 100 miles per hour. If you multiply both sides by 100 miles per hour, you get this equation. If you throw that into your calculator, you're going to get approximately 94. And I miswrote these x's. They should be v sub x's. So to answer the question as a sentence, you should write this sentence down. The eastward component has a magnitude of 94.0 miles per hour. Sentence answer for these vector problems, please.
Question 13. Two planes leave an airport at noon. How far apart are they at 2 p.m. when they both fly at a speed of 200 miles per hour, one with a heading of 10 degrees and the other with a heading of 100 degrees? So let's tackle the time first. They're going from noon to 2 p.m. So if you take 2 p.m. and subtract from it 12 o'clock, you're going to get two hours. They're both starting and stopping at the same point, so that means that both of these planes are traveling for two hours. If they had different times, I wouldn't use a T. I would use T in a subscript, but they both have the same times. Their velocities are also the same. It says 200 miles per hour. If they had separate velocities, I would use V sub 1 and V sub 2. What's the distance that they're traveling? Plane 1's distance is going to be equivalent to plane 2, plane 2, because they're both traveling for the same time with the same velocity. Well, how do you figure out the distance of either of these? You take their velocity times time. Both their velocities are 200 miles per hour. Both their times are 2 hours. If you multiply those together, you're going to get both their distances from their starting points are 400 miles. So how would the picture look for these planes? Let's say this is north, south, east, west. The first plane has a heading of 10 degrees. So from north, if it says it has a heading of 10 degrees, that's a navigational heading. And that means you start at north and you go clockwise. So that's 10 degrees. This is plane 1. The other one has a heading of 100 degrees. So starting at north, here to here is 90. 10 more is going to put us here. This is 100 degrees. This is plane 2. And the question is, how far apart are they? It's asking for the third side of this triangle. We currently don't know either any of the angles in the triangle. Pretty easy to figure out, though. Let's call this angle in the triangle alpha. Alpha plus 10 degrees is 100 degrees. This is the angle addition postulate from geometry, which means that alpha is 90 degrees. That makes that convenient for us. This is a right triangle. We know lots of stuff about right triangles. Also, something else that's convenient, each of these planes went 400 miles. Which means that this is a right triangle and the legs are the same length. This is a special right triangle. Let me redraw this picture. Uh, don't erase the picture you have. I'm just going to erase it so I can redraw it because I don't have a a ton of space here. So when you strip away this to its core, we have a right triangle. Each leg is 400 miles. I'm trying to find the length of the hypotenuse, which we'll call R. And since the legs are the same length, that means these angles are the same. So are going to be 45 degrees. With doing little to no work, if opposite 45 is 400, opposite 90 is that times the square root of 2. So it's 400 square root of 2 miles. The question was, how far apart are the planes at 2 o'clock? So sentence answer, we wouldn't want to use 400 square root of 2. If you put that in your calculator, even though that's an exact answer, you would never say to someone, the planes are 400 square roots of 2 miles apart, because they would laugh in your face. Sentence answer. At noon, the planes are about 565.7 miles apart. And that finishes the problem.